Do you want Detroit sports talk done right? Yeah! If you want it, you got it. It's Detroit sports talk with attitude. It's the knee jerks with Eno and Big Al. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like at this time to introduce to you uh, one of the finest running backs in the United States of America and our number one pick, Barry Sanders. Here's Isaiah. Let's see what we got. All the way up. Go! We might not be in your car or on your transistor radio, but we're bringing you the best of Detroit sports past, present, and future. It's time for the Knee Jerks with two guys who know Detroit sports. Here's Greg Eno and Al Beaton. It's March 9th, 2021. That means it's time for the Knee Jerks Detroit Sports Talk with Eno and Big Al. I'm the Big Al of the Equation, Al Beaton, longtime Detroit based podcaster, blogger, and bomb avant. <laughs> Joining me as always is the man who knows a lot of things about a lot of things and a personal friend of Greg Campy, and that would be Greg Eno of uh, the Out of Bounds blog, uh, longtime partner of me podcasting, and numerous other things. So, Greg, what's up? <laughs> who isn't a friend of Greg yeah. Campy? Right? <laughs> yeah, I had to bring that up because actually the, his game is actually underway on ESPN right now. He's a, he's a win away from, the e, from making the uh, NCAA tournament. Yeah, uh, good for them because they did not – have a lot of hope. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They had an awful start this year. And uh, Campy, who uh, to this day we've been doing this show for twelve years almost, and, and he is one of my favorite interviews that we ever did. Yeah. Uh, he was terrific. I mean, he was so candid, and uh, I, I could have talked to that guy forever. That was, that was one of the one of my favorite interviews we've ever done was with Greg Campy. And uh, anyway, uh, thank you. I'm Greg. You know, from uh, Out of Bounds WordPress blog. Uh, you can see me there pretty much every week. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Greg Eno and follow the Knee Jerks on Twitter at the Knee Jerks. Um, we, I've kind of got a hard out tonight, so I've, I've got about we got about an hour and ten, an hour and fifteen minutes here to get through just probably a couple of topics. We'll definitely do the Lions with with Galladay going on with uh, um, not being tagged, franchise tagged. Uh, we'll talk about maybe about some other personnel things going on with the Lions. We'll talk about the Blake Griffin situation and the Pistons in general, uh, and then we'll see where we land after that. Uh, by the way, I, I like the bon, bon Vivant uh, description. <laughs> I always thought of you as a, as a bon bon. Well, a you're bon. in a renaissance, man, so I had to come up with some for myself. So, <laughs> This is uh, – well, before we do any of that, we're going we're gonna to play a game that we like to call Whose Birthday Is It Maestro. <laughs> we baked you a birthday cake. If you get a tummy ache and you moan and groan and woe, don't forget we told you so. Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Everybody knows how we play this game by now. I'll give Al a clue or two or three of an individual whose birthday it is today in the world of sports. And if Al can correctly guess that person within the first two clues, he'll win a Smith Corona electric typewriter. Ah, uh, not a Selectric, though. Not an, not an IBM Selectric. So, yo, you're going low rent. <laughs> yeah. You got a low budget here on them. Yeah, I got a low budget on the knee jerks, folks. <laughs> uh, if you haven't known that by now, you, you, you haven't been listening. Oh, yeah. Um, this person now made his name in football. Uh, he was born on this date in 1965. Um, and actually made more of his name, I would say, in the college ranks, although he did play professional. Mm -hmm. He uh, was a defensive player who won uh, a an award in college that's given out to the best at his position twice, which is unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, and he also played in the professional ranks in the AFC West. Oh, AFC West. I'm just going to throw one out there and say Hugh Green. No, good guess, though. Uh, uh, although I think Hugh Green played for the – did he play for the Dolphins? He might have. You know, cause this, I, know, cause I know his pro career didn't live up to his, his college career yeah. hit. But right. I was just, that's just, for some reason, he was one of those guys that came to mind because he was so dominant in college. No, he was. No, yeah. Hugh Green was, for sure. No question about it. Uh, but that is not, I think Hugh Green went to Pitt. Yes, he did. Mistaken. He went to Pitt. Uh, this person um, is not Hugh Green, but uh, it was a good guess, and we will uh, take right. that up with uh, the next clue. All right. Well, let's move on to, uh, I guess, our speed rounds at this point, since we don't have our normal two hours. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, obviously, the big news. Uh, toss-up question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> obviously, the big news, and uh, at least uh, in the Detroit area today, was the uh, franchise tag deadline. It was 4 o'clock this afternoon. 
Uh, there was talk it might be extended because they still haven't settled on what the salary cap is going to be, even though we know it's going to be lower than it was last year because of the pandemic, which is another whole discussion altogether. Regardless of that, there was a hard deadline, and the Lions finally decided after it seems like two years of what's going to happen to Kenny Galladay, well, we finally know what's going to happen to Kenny Galladay. He's likely not going to be a Lion because they declined to give him the franchise tag. Uh, obviously, there's a the Lions are having issues with the salary cap, thanks to some god-awful contracts from the Quintricia re- regime. Uh, they've all but admitted they're rebuilding. Uh, a wide receiver who's going to make at least $16 million for one year may not fit their... Uh, uh, it doesn't really. I don't think it fits in what's going on with the Lions at this point. But we'll get into that. Uh, and of course, there's always the. There was a news yesterday that broke. I believe it was. I think Ian Rappaport broke it. I wasn't sure it was him or Schefter. Uh, that Galladay reportedly turned down a contract extension worth more than 18 million a year from the previous regime. So essentially, he's betting on himself. And plus, there's also the fact that the uh, upcoming draft is supposedly loaded at wideout. So when you factor all that in together, I think you could pretty much read the tea leaves. You could see this coming at the Lions and Galladay were going to part ways, even though he could still sign a contract with the Lions. This does not mean the Lions cannot continue to negotiate with him, but for our, I think for all intents and purposes, Greg, I think that means Kenny Galladay's time as the Lions over, because I don't see him returning since he's already he's ter- returned down one massive, massive deal. And I don't think he wants to go through a rebuild at age... Well, he's going to be 28 years old by the time Thanksgiving rolls around. So uh, this was just one of those... I think the timing was bad for everybody, for, the, for the, both parties. And it's just, at least to me, the parting of the ways makes sense. It's a shame that they're not going to get much of anything for him. They might get a compensatory pick next year. No, depending on what goes on with free agency this year, but essentially you're losing a probably a top fifteen wide receiver for nothing, which hurts. Which I think normally that would be insane, but we're in insane times when it comes to the Lions, Greg. Well, you know, this is a we've been talking about this in the weeks leading up to this decision. Um, and I, I, you know, I think you, I think last time we were together, you asked me about it. It was either last time or the time before. And I said, right. I kind of landed on the side of that. I, I would want to sign him long term. Yeah. Uh, Cause my belief was that rebuilds in the NFL don't have to take three to five years. Like you right. do in other sports, they can, right. you can turn around things relatively quickly. Yeah. You got to get a little bit of luck and you got to hit on some draft choices and, and so forth. And, course but um you know in the nfl you don't have to go through you don't have to tear everything all the way to the ground and then build all the way back yeah not like the other three teams in town right now that's for sure right so uh you know in my opinion is if you're going to have want to have yourself be you know relevant sooner rather than later you have to have some uh building blocks uh, on your team now uh, you know but by having an elite receiver like kenny galladay does that of course mean that that you or by not having one doesn't mean you can't win. Of course, I understand that. But the Lions have such, to me, precious few bona fide, you know, star players. Mm-hmm. That um, and I, you know, he's only twenty seven. Right. I thought that you know this is his one chance to really you know strike it rich. I understand that it's a lot of money, no question about it. Um, and you know, it's franchise tagging him would have only kicked the can down the road. And 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 you you've mentioned on numerous occasions on this show that that. Franchise tagging players usually makes them unhappy, but mm-hmm. I was a little surprised. Not although when I listened to um, Brad Holmes and uh, Dan Campbell, I was last week. They talked yeah. to the media, and I kind of reading the tea leaves, uh, and they were asking them about, of course, about Galladay, and, and kind of reading the tea leaves there. I did. I wasn't as convinced after listening to them talk last mm-hmm. week that they were going to bring Galladay back <clears throat> as I was prior to that. Um, in fact, after I listened to them talk, I said, well, it sounds like they may not, they may, they may be leaning toward not tagging him and not, not really making any sort of a concerted effort uh, to indeed sign him long-term. So um, this doesn't shock me, mm-hmm. this decision, uh, when I came across uh, the wire that they, they were not going to offer him a, or tag him. And now he's essentially, is, is next week, he can sign with any team he wants in the NFL when he becomes a free agent. 
And uh, that's probably what he's going to do. I, I would be shocked at this point if you went back mm-hmm. to the Lions. So now this means that the Lions are as thin as thin can be at wide receiver, although Holmes does have you know, experience with the, with the Rams and, and turning a very thin receiver room into a pretty stout one relatively quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's going to have to do the same thing in Detroit because they only have uh, Cephas, Quintess Cephas, uh, under contract. Uh, as far as guys who actually caught a pass last year, he's the only one who's on the team who caught a pass. So they're going to have to build it up quickly. Of course, they can do that. I mean, you've got there's lots of time to do that. You've you've got uh, the draft and free agency and you know what have you, undrafted free agency. Can a lot of things they can do. But the Galladay thing, Al. I mean, um, you know, I, I understand you know your the money thing, but um, I just think he's a he's a he's a, a franchise type player and. Um, I, I just don't know how this is going to be received, no pun intended, by the fan base, given um, there's a lot of goodwill that that, uh, that Sheila Ford Hamp has built in the short time that she's been the, the you know the owner. Mm-hmm. She's uh, I, I, my impression is the public the court of public opinion is on her side. They they re- I think they really like the that she made the move with Patricia and Quinn when she did. I think she, they, I think they like Campbell. I think they like the Holmes thing. I think they'll like the, the co- coaching staff. I think they like the job that she's doing overall, bringing in people, bringing in resources, um, seemingly not willing to um, skimp. Mm-hmm. And I think that she's built up, a, frankly, a, a, a pretty, I, I think the, the, the approval rating right now would be pretty high if you were to pull Lions fans, albeit, uh, the, the the fan base is very bitter and very um, um, what's the word I'm looking for when you're um, the, the word escapes me but um, you know they're very suspicious uh, that's not the word but they're very suspicious of of, uh, of the, the team in general but I think she's you know gotten some good will here so it'd be interesting to see how this decision with um, with uh, Galladay is received I think for I. I think the fan base is, for the most part, going to improve. Uh, there's there, obviously there's going to be a segment that, 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 that will say what you just did that oh he's a you know he should be a franchise cornerstone. You, you know these guys are hard to find, and you got him in the third round, so you had him cheap for five years. But uh, I have a I think the Lions fan base at this point, especially after uh-huh. the past three years of the uh, of uh, of Patriots West that absolutely blew up in everybody's face. They're in the same boat as Pistons fans were, in that they've tried and tried and tried and tried to build a playoff contending team. And the best thing any both franchises could do was first, was, uh, in the Lions' case, losing a wild card game, and in the Pistons' case, getting knocked out and for you know losing, being swept out in the first round. I mean, these are both teams that have tried for uh, quite a while to. For the Lions specifically, since they've drafted Matthew Stafford, they've essentially continued trying to build around him. Continue, and they, they just never could break it down all the way to the studs like we've seen the Pistons finally start to do and the Tigers and Red Wings are trying to are essentially trying to climb back out of right now. So I think right now, Greg, I'm with you. I don't think a rebuild should take three or five years. It should take three years max. I mean, this is a team that made the playoffs three years after 0-16. And, you know, and we've seen the Browns pretty much do the same thing. But I do think this team needed to be gutted in some ways. And I would, I think really this comes down to a couple things with Galladay. It comes down to three years from now, if you're expecting the Lions to be good, you're probably paying a 31-year-old Kenny Galladay $20 million a year. And he's not... The type of well, you know, essentially at that age, I have a feeling he's going to be more like Anquan Bolden, a possession receiver, because you know, obviously he he, he has he doesn't have the speed, he doesn't have the separation. That's always been the talk of Galley. He just doesn't get separation. So <laughs> he's like almost every ball thrown to him is a fifty-fifty ball. You know, he does he gets the majority of them, and it's I th- I just think. It would be uh, at the end of the contract, like most of these are, it would be bad. And the problem is the Lions are gambling that they're going to be good by that point and don't want a possibility of having a uh, boat anchor of a contract, which any which you're always taking a chance with when you're paying anybody top-tier money 
when they're pushing their late twenties. I have a feeling that playing a lot into it. Yeah, and you know, I think you mentioned last time uh, injuries. The injuries. Yeah, he missed most of last year. Bad timing for yep. him, for sure. That's not. That's not. The, that's not the year you want to have a an injury, but it happened. Um, but still, in the in the in the time that he in the games that he did play, it, it was clear, it was evident that the Lions were a much better team offensively with him than they were without him. I mean, it's just that's just don't. There's no question about that. Just the eye test will tell you that. You don't even have to look at any statistics to to confirm that. But uh, you know, I, I think you know. I mean, I, I, I'm not. I'm not saying you can't make a case for to do what they did because you can. You can right. make a case for them not uh, for them making the decision they, they made. I mean, there's, mm-hmm. I mean, it wasn't a no brainer to right. me to, to sign them. Um, and I'm not going to lose any sleep over it either. At the same time, but um, you know, it'll be interesting. I mean, this is. Um, you know they they made their decision, and um, you know this is um, this is a new regime, and and and, and certainly I don't I never knew Galladay to be a, a bad apple, or I know he, he did some, you know, kind of you know maybe some borderline arrogant tweets last year, fine or whatever. I mean that's the NFL players are going to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I recall him. I don't think he had. I don't recall him being a bad apple or having any issues with uh, the coaches or no. you know, in the in the, in the locker room or anything like that. So. Um, you know, he's a kid that came from a small school, a relatively small school. Um, and it's funny how some of these receivers like Randy Moss, they come from the – and Jerry Rice, as far as that goes, come from these relatively small schools mm-hmm. and just, you know, turn into these amazing uh, receivers. Just goes to show you, you don't have to come from Alabama or Ohio State or, or a place like that to be, you know, to be a, a big-time uh, receiver. Right. So, uh, but, yeah, it, it's uh, – it's, it's, um, it's over and done with, and, and um, the you know uh, Brad Holmes has just got to go and find some receivers. I mean, that's all there is to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it, yeah, it's it's a shame it worked out this way, but I think uh, the current regime was given a shit sandwich by the previous regime, and this is part of cleaning up that mess, you know, because this should have been taken care of a couple years ago. I mean, you don't allow franchise type players to reach to, don't get to this point. You lock them up, period. And I have a feeling Galladay, much like Christian Wood of the Pistons, probably just didn't want to be here. And plus he wants to get paid. So when you factor those two things together, uh, I don't think the, 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 I don't think uh, uh the Lions had much of a chance of keeping him, and I think they knew that, and they decided let's just cut our losses right now and hope we yeah. get a very good, which would be like a third round compensatory pick next year, mm-hmm. which is entirely possible. So we'll see. But uh, along with that, Greg Romeo Cara is not going to be franchise tagged either. He was the Lions, I think, is question the Lions' best defensive player last year. Uh, he's only 25 years old. He had a breakout season, career year, 10 sacks, which was 10th uh, in the NFL. Uh, he had 61 quarterback pressures, which was 5th overall in the NFL. Essentially, he was the closest thing the Lions defense had to an impact player. Uh, but his franchise tag would have been even more than uh, Kenny Galladay's. If they had franchise tagged him... It would have been in, I believe, around the eighteen million dollar range. I think Galladay's was going to be sixteen to seventeen million. Uh, and for a guy who is in his fifth season, put up elite numbers. But the previous four, he was just a guy. You know, he was essentially just a league average rotational player, nothing more, nothing less. This year, Allison becomes a sack artist. Uh, it seems like a bit of a reach to franchise. I don't think any team would have done it. I think for Okara was it was this is this is like the perfect storm for Okara coming into free agency has an absolute monster year for him especially on a bad team he really stood out at a position that teams in the league value almost to a ridiculously high extent that would be in defensive end so if you franchise tag him you're probably overpaying him and if you're going to sign him in free agency, you're probably going to overpay him. But the problem, I guess the question is, was 2020 an outlier for him? Or is this what you can expect from him in years to come? Because he's not even in his prime yet. He's only 25. The, the thing is, someone's going to back up the Brinks truck. Someone's going to take that risk and go like four years, you know, 
fifty million dollars or something like that, or even more. And do you want? Do you do that in today's when, especially when you don't know what you know? What in a in a season where the salary cap's going down, someone's going to do it. Someone's going to gamble. Someone's going to back up their Brinks truck. But I think the Lions did the. You know, is this is the value there for us? I think it kind of worked out the way it does with Galladay. Yeah, we need a guy like him, but I don't think they could justify the kind of money he's looking for right now. No, I I, I agree there for sure. Uh, you know, you got to you got to do it probably a little bit longer. Um, you know, guy, and I'm not saying this is the case with him, but yeah. you know, guys can you know have that one year. You know, I remember when Kerry Hyder was all the rage. Remember when Kerry Hyder yeah. was all the yeah. rage. Mm-hmm. And then he came back the next year, hurt his knee, I think, in the early in the exhibition season. And it seemed at the time like it was a just a terrible blow yeah. to the Lions. And uh, Kerry Hyder is, I don't know where I don't even want to know where he is. I know he's in the league. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know where he where in the league right. he is. I'm and with you. So I mean that you know, and nothing and this is not a, I'm not hating on a Quora. He, he had a very good year and, and he like you said, he's twenty five. This may be the beginning of something great to come for him. Yeah. And for somebody who does indeed get him. But I think th- making the case in his instance to not franchise is a whole lot easier and a whole lot more cut and dry yeah. uh than the one about Galladay. But uh you know the the Lions too, I don't forget the Lions over the next three years, twenty twenty one twenty one, twenty two and twenty three. Mm-hmm. Have if unless things change, have five first round draft picks mm-hmm. over the next three yeah. drafts. Yeah, they've got their own, of course, and um, over those next three years, and they've got two uh, coming I mean, and then additional ones from the Rams in right. twenty two and twenty three. So that's five first rounders in the next three years. Mm-hmm. Um, one this year, and then two right. each of the next two years. So they've got a lot of. Uh, just in the just in the first round, a lot of yeah. uh, capital there, um, and they only need to you know, and they've got some people who in the front office who have had success in the draft. Uh, so this is, if, if you're a Lions fan, you're looking for something positive in, in this rebuild, whatever, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and don't forget all the other picks they have too. And you mentioned the compensatory they may get from Galladay. Right. All of a sudden now they're they're stockpiling draft capital, and if those are used. Um, and that's what the Rams did, by the way. The Rams, uh, right. not only in building their, not only in building their receiving core, mm-hmm. but in building their team. The 49ers are the same thing, and, and with yeah. John Lynch, they, 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 they really. And I know you got to get lucky. I understand that, and I, I, I get it. But um, it's funny how the good teams are always lucky, huh? Always yeah. Lucky. <laughs> and um, so we'll see. Well, they've got a lot of, uh, you know, they've got a lot to work with, and. Yeah. and um, so uh, the coach is in play. Coach has got a long-term contract. The GM is new. Uh, they've got uh, you know a lot of veteran people to help everyone out there. So th- this is about as well set up I've seen the Lions be in a long, long time. But we'll see what that what ultimately that means. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's the question. I mean, if, if people are enthused right now. People are excited that we seem to have. A front office that actually, like for example, set the market for quarterbacks. For example, you know they actually went out and said, right, "No, we're not going to react. We're going to make this happen, and we're going to set a certain price." And you know, and then they played the market to the point where they, as they were able to get this haul of draft picks plus a starting quarterback in return for Matthew Stafford. So in golf, so I think that alone is something I don't think we've ever seen from a Lions front office actually be proactive. You know, even if Matthew Stafford did grease the skids by asking for a trade, right? You know, how, you know, there, I'm sure previous regimes, or say, if uh, uh, one of the old Fords, be it uh, William Clay or Martha, were still in charge, they may not have, you know, or this may it may not have gotten to this point, you know, with uh, uh, with those two in charge because you know they were loyal to a fault, you know, and they loved Matthew Stafford. So, you know, this, I, you know, in this this. Regime may be a little more. I don't want to say cold blooded because I know the uh, uh, Bob Quinn and Matt Patricia were very cold blooded, but I would say that this they so far anyway, this seems like the smartest front office we've seen in the in, in from the Lions in a lo- very long time, if not at least in our lifetimes, Greg. Because so far, I have 
you know, you could make an argument either way when it comes to Galladay. But I think everything else they've done to this point has been smart and proactive. And hopefully that will continue when it comes to the draft and some of the free agent signings. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and also, uh, uh, there's, uh, they, they've, uh, they've all, the cap casualties have begun. Jamie Collins has had his contract restructured, so he... He is a linebacker who it will be here next year because of that, and I don't have too much trouble with that because he was their best linebacker. That's not, not no great shakes, but he's okay. Uh, but Desmond Trufant is gone, the cornerback. Linebacker Christian Jones is gone. Russell Bodine, Bodine, uh, Jethro, whatever you want to call him, is gone. He's a, a center. Actually, sat out last year. Uh, looks like Danny Shelton, Nick Williams, Justin Coleman, Jesse James, probably even Chase Daniel. I don't believe those trade rumors for a minute about him. Looks like they're all going to be, if not cash ca- uh, cap casualties, they're all possibilities of being on the chopping block. So we're no, we're going to see a no football teams. Greg turn over their rosters quite a bit, but yeah. this is going you know from year to year. But I think this is almost going to be unprecedented if, if you're a Lions fan at the amount of actual change we're going to see in this roster. I mean, from starting quarterback on down, there's going to be a new quarterback. There's going to be almost an all-new wide receivers room. There's probably Right now, there's probably only one tight end right now, and, and uh, TJ Hawkinson. Uh, the defensive backfield, uh, for the most part, you know, two, three guys right now. You know, uh, and the defensive line could be entirely blown up. We know the linebacking uh, room is going to be blown up. This is going to be, you know... It'll, who knows how good or bad the roster is going to be, but I think uh, the 2021 roster is going to be almost unrecognizable when you compare it to 2020. Good. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a good thing. Uh, well, why not? I mean, you know, mm-hmm. clearly it wasn't working. The, the, mm-hmm. the defense was shredded. I mean, just absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think back to that Tampa Bay game. My goodness gracious. Oh, when the, when the 0-16 team was better defensively? That says oh, volumes. God. Uh, you know, yeah. and so, yeah, why not? Uh, go, yeah. You know, uh, go for it. Um, yeah. Um, and, you know, but uh, you, you, hit, you, you, met, you hit it you, you, earlier when you said they seem like they've got a very smart – yeah, smart group of people. Analytical decisions now. Yeah, yeah, and it's, and the, I think what the most uh, the thing that's uh, I don't think they're going to go for quote unquote a type other than fast guys with speed. I know we're not going to see any of this this uh, Quinn and Patricia reaching or decide this is the only kind of player we're going to set our eyes on. So that what gives you guys, you know, that's what gives you. Guys like Javani Tavai as a starting linebacker, no, rather than you know drafting someone like Devin White or someone like that who maybe not fit that mold, but was far more talented. But he didn't fit. He didn't have long enough arms. <laughs> you know, he wasn't heavy enough. And uh, you know, it's I'm, I'm not going to miss that. You know, draft talent, draft talent, draft talent. That's you know that's how you win in any league, and especially the NFL. You need talent. It's, I think. Scheme in many ways is overrated unless you're like Andy Reid or somebody, and Matt Patricia was no Andy Reid, so or or uh, Bill Belichick for that matter. So just get as much talent as they can, and the best way to do that is build it through the draft. And they're already starting to build up that draft capital, and they will likely get more after free agency is done, and guys like Okara and uh, Galladay have moved on. So. We may be, hopefully we're in a better place three years from now, Greg. If we're even still doing this podcast three years from now. But I'm sure we will. So, <laughs> anyway. Uh, before we move on to the Pistons. Uh, uh, question two of birthday game. Sure. Well, I'll try to get that get you that Smith Corona. Um, Can I trade it in on a Selectric? <laughs> <laughs> that's what I learned cost. to type on in high school. That, that's why I keep bringing that up. At your own cost. Yeah. Uh, this person... <laughs> um, Born in 1965, like I said, um, a defensive player. Mm-hmm. Um, it turns out to be a, he was a much better player in college, as it turned yeah. out, than he was in the pros. He had he was, his career was cut short by injury. Very, a uh, very um, uh, outspoken. Let's put it. Brian that Bosworth. Way. Yes, very good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, All of a sudden, it just clicked. Yes. Yeah, Bosworth. Because remember, he was uh, he was a dominant player in college at Oklahoma. 
and then he played for Seattle, which was the West Coast, with the, uh, with the West thing. So He sent a letter out to like 12 teams before he was drafted saying, I won't play for you, don't draft yep. me. Uh, he was trash talking from the moment he set foot on the field, trash talk Bo Jackson, which backfired on him, Tra- uh, trash talk John Elway, and, and, and he was just, you know, he was the boss, and, and uh, that's the way it was. He, he, was, he, was a very, he was a very, very smart guy. And that, what's the story they always tell about him is that when he was in college, uh, they were selling anti Boz t shirts. Who was selling them? Brian Bosworth. <laughs> and now he's well, made a, know, actually, and he's made a career Bosworth, in Hollywood making B movies. Bosworth came out came out with a book yeah. called I think called The Boz or something yeah. like that. Um, wrote it with with uh, Rick Riley and. That book, which I think came out like in his second year of the NFL, which was the year he got hurt, right. exposed a lot of crap in the Barry Switzer yeah. program in Oklahoma, right. and it basically caused Switzer to resign. Yeah, because yeah, uh, Bosworth had all these different accusations about how it was loosey goosey and people were on steroids, and yeah. and there was all sorts of nonsense going on with that around that program. And we all know that Switzer was loosey goosey anyway, and yeah. and it just got to the point where uh, it was. This stuff came out, and he was forced to resign. Of course, he was hired by the, eventually hired by the, the Cowboys. Yep. But it, it really exposed the Barry Switzer shenanigans in mm-hmm. Oklahoma. And yep. um, but uh, yeah, he just he had a bad shoulder. He never really recovered. He only played I think two seasons. Right. Yeah. Home. He was a good player, but like I said, the injury cut him short. And yeah. And 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 now he's starring in Dr Pepper commercials. And that, oh, as he? they say, is the rest of the story. As I do is my. He? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, in those uh, goofy college football Dr. Pepper commercials, and Brian Bosworth is the sheriff in those now. But yeah, to his credit, he had, I have a feeling that probably was his plan to begin with, have a short football career, get my name out there, and then make my money where I won't be ruining my health. And he's yeah. Say what you will about Brian Bosworth, he was no dummy. He was uh, the master at self-promotion. Well, Especially for signed, someone at his age, signed, was ridiculous. He signed it at the time, which was the most, I think, most audacious college contract or kind of college contract, but yeah. col- contract for a player just out of college, mm-hmm. 10 years. He signed his original mm-hmm. contract was for 10 years with the Seahawks. So I don't know that he necessarily thought he was going to have a short career. I don't, although yeah. I don't know if anybody thought he'd play all 10 years, right. but certainly that the Seahawks thought that he, that yeah. he uh, yeah. might. And so they gave him 10 years and $11 million, which is funny because $11 million now won't even buy a, yeah. a, a you know, a starting, you know, left tackle. Right. right. But uh, anyway, that's it. So good, good right. job. We'll, so, get the, we'll get you that Smith Corona. I will put it right next to my Dell computer. And yeah. <laughs> All right. With that, uh, let's move on to the Pistons. The last time we talked, Greg, as Alexa is making funny noises at me, I think I got a delivery, but uh, it can wait. Anyway, uh, last time we talked about the Pistons was our last podcast, and that's when the news broke that the Pistons and Blake Griffin – we're agreeing to part ways. It was just a matter if it was going to be a trade or a buyout because, once again, this is another guy where the timelines don't match, and, and he's uh, brought in by the previous regime. There's, it, it, it just wasn't working at this point. Uh, and the, the least surprising news of the past two weeks, Greg, it was the Pistons were unable to trade Griffin's contract, which I believe he was owed approximately $75 million dollars. If you factor in the uh, the if you factor in the player option, but uh, if, so we have a buyout which was announced uh, couple, uh, this week. Uh, to his credits, I don't know how much credit you want to give him. He reportedly gave back thirteen point three million of his contract, which is a split approximately to five million this year, eight million next year. And that leaves Detroit with a salary cap next year, dead cap hit essentially, of twenty five point six million. But on a team that's rebuilding, on a team that is going to be essentially Jeremy Grant role players like Mason Plumley and Josh Jackson and a bunch of rookies, that twenty five point six million really doesn't mean that much because you got so many guys on rookie contracts. So they will be they'll have no trouble staying under the cap. And they still might be able to do a little bit in free agency. So I think the best news of all this, though, Greg, is they didn't do the Josh Smith thing. 
They are not going to stretch that money over, what, four years or something, four or five years, whatever it is. Six years? I forgot what it was. I think it was six with Smith, wasn't it? (laughs) It was something ridiculous. And uh, they're not going to uh, stretch that money, take uh, take that full cap hit. So they'll have the books completely cleared of uh, of Griffin in 2022, 2023, which is the smart thing to do on a team that is rebuilding. It makes absolutely no sense. If you're planning on being good, say, three, four years from now, to still have to deal with a dead cap hit of eight or nine million, whatever it would be with Blake Griffin. So makes perfect sense with how this ended up going down. Uh, Br- Griffin proceeded to ink a deal, Greg, with the uh, latest super team, the Brooklyn Nets. He'll join uh, Kevin Durant, James Harden, and Kyrie Irving as he uh, goes on to chase a ring, likely making the vet minimum. So I think we all saw this coming. Like I said in the last podcast, we just thought this was going to happen next year, not this year. And I'm still, you know, a, a little bit chuffed, I guess, that Griffin, if you wanted to get out here so badly, just just decline the player option. Would have made things, it, but you know that is so much money. I, I mean, I would probably, if I was Blake Griffin, I would have done the same thing. But even though, as a fan, you know, I would have said, "Well, if you want to leave, just leave," and it, it would be much simpler if you just declined the option. But that was ever going to happen. So I'm not surprised it ended up working out this way, probably for the best. $13.3 million is not chump change by any means. And that $8 million or so next year will help the team. I think what helps them even more is that now that they don't have Blake Griffin on the roster, they're going to see, we're going to have a lot more playing time for guys like Isaiah Stewart and Jeremy Grant, who can play his more natural position. And, uh, and we get to see more of point center Mason Plumley. So <laughs> Mr. Triple Double. Which is, you know, I've actually been making some money on, on Mason Bumbley betting on him on prop bets because he's been playing so well as a, as a passing center. So, you know, in the end, it all worked out probably. I don't think it, it, it seemed to be fairly unacrimonious. There are no blood was spilled, so to speak. I think both parties say this is for the best. Let's just cut ties right now and not drag it out for another year. Uh, and I think we, you know, when the trade was made, we all figured it was probably going to end this way. But at least we'll always have 2018, 2019, where you put a shitty team on his back and carry that team to the playoffs. So at least we had that one year of him playing absolutely out of his mind. But much like, you know, it kind of brings to mind to me, remember Milt Wilcox in 1984? Had his oh. career year. He, had, he was never any better. But he also ruined himself physically doing it, and he was never the same pitcher again. And he was another guy. He was well into his 30s at that point. And, and that one year essentially ended his career as a useful player. It's kind of looking like that 2018-2019 season may have done the same to Blake Griffin, where he's you know, that was his last hurrah as an all-NBA, all-star type player. And now he's just going to be like a number eight guy coming off the bench for the Brooklyn Nets, you know, playing 15, 20 minutes a game. So we'll see how that all works out, but it is what it is at this point. Well, one person who was not impressed Mm -hmm. with Blake Griffin, I'm not sure if you saw this or not, Chris Broussard. No, I didn't. uh, uh, I'm not surprised a guy like Broussard would, uh, would be a contrarian about it. I don't know, contrarian. I can, I, well, what did he say exactly? Well, he's not on board at all. He says that Blake Griffin can't jump, he can't defend, he, his shot is gone because he's had yeah. leg injuries recently, and he does, he does not see this as being a move that moves the needle for the Nets I can, whatsoever. He, I can kind of agree with that uh, after watching him play the last two years. You know, I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I, I don't know what... what Nets what fans the think they uh, are overrating this move. I'm with you there. Yeah, well, it, it, right. But on the other hand, what is he going to be asked to do in Brooklyn? I mean, he's not yeah. going to—you know—he's not going to be asked. You mentioned fifteen, twenty minutes a night. That's you know, that's probably right. You yeah. know, uh, maybe. I mean, you can make the case for maybe because he won't be wor- playing a lot of minutes, or or at least not as many minutes as he's playing with the Pistons, that mm-hmm. may help a little bit. He doesn't have to be as good for as long as he might have to be with the Nets. But Broussard's thing was that uh, he just doesn't see it. He doesn't see Griffin being the 
the missing piece uh, yeah. to the Nets um, uh, run here. We'll see. Uh, but uh, he was pretty adamant. I mean, uh, Broussard was. He was. He didn't. He didn't mince any words whatsoever. But you know, hey, you know, uh, these guys. You know, Griffin's never won. He hasn't won a thing in his career, an NBA career. Really, he really hasn't. Right. So, I mean, I can see from his perspective why he would want to do this. The Nets, you know, I, I guess, you know, they're, they're in a situation where they, they feel like their window may be closing as well. I mean, nobody really has a big window in the NBA anyway. I mean, it no. seems like it's everything's always so fleeting. Mm-hmm. Uh, these teams can, you can go bad in a hurry. Look at the Warriors. You can go bad in a, just like that. So I can understand where you, if there's always an urgency when you get to that, you know, when you and I started following the NBA, or, or, mm-hmm. or not started following the NBA, but like in the 80s, in those bad, bad boys years, Isaiah et al., mm-hmm. You know, you, you could be good, you know, for five, six, seven, eight years, not win a title necessarily, but be good, be competitive, be relevant. There were a lot of teams in the league back then, Al, that were, yeah. that were just perennially good. I mean, well, you just, just described the girl in the work business. Same yeah, thing. They, were, they just, yeah, they were just good every year. Yeah. You can count on them to be good. And now, yeah. you know, teams are good for a very short period of time. And, yeah. and I'm looking, I'm even looking at Milwaukee. And yeah, okay, they're they're fleeing their division and so forth, but you know, twenty two and fourteen, which last time I checked, that was the record, isn't great. I yeah. mean, you know, you 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 know, they're, you, they figure to be you figure they'd be a fifty five to sixty win team, I think. Well, now they're 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 the pace to win fifty. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, if, in an, extrapolated to an eighty two game season, winning fifty games. You know, yeah. which you know that's that's not a great team, mm-hmm. and, and they've got the best player on the planet, arguably. Uh, at least one of the best for sure. Yeah, yeah. And they, and, and they, so I can see why the Nets would 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 look at you know Harden's not getting any younger and and would look at this and say, you know this if they feel like he's the guy that could you know with Durant who's not getting any younger either would say look you know we feel like this is the guy I can see it I can see why I can see both sides I can see why a guy mm-hmm. like Broussard would would poo poo it and I can also see why the Nets would take a flyer because you know. Um, First of all, in fairness, how often can you add a guy like that right. in the middle of the season? Now, when you can say whatever you want about him, is that you know, he doesn't have he's not the same player as he was. We all know that. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. not, that's nothing new. But those kind of guys, though, Al, even though he doesn't have a championship pedigree, you know, he's he's had greatness. He's been great. And when mm-hmm. you have guys, you can bring guys in like that, kind of like a Derrick Rose situation. When you can bring in guys who've been great, mm-hmm. um, or at least near great. Um, for a period of time in, in the league, and even if they're not the player that they used to be, you know, that's when you're a team like the Nets, yeah. I can see why you would do that. I really do. Uh, mm-hmm. but, but because, you know, it's, it's a lot different playing with Durant, Irving, and Harden than it is playing with the, 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 the roster the Pistons have. So, uh, you know, we'll see. Yeah, and if, if, if Griffin is used, is used correctly, sparingly, you don't, yeah, if you, yeah, if uh, I think he could be a very useful piece for them, you know, uh, th- there's no question that he was able to reinvent his game and in into he can pass from the perimeter, he can shoot, at least until this year <laughs> he could shoot a three pointer. Depends if you know he's, uh, if that lift is completely gone off his jumper, that may change. But it, but you got to hide him on defense. You got to pick your spots with him, I guess. And you, you know, I'm sure against certain lineups, you just can't play him. Or you have to play him sparingly is because, uh, you know, he's kind of a pylon out there now. I hate to say it. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, for in the big scheme of things, when he's like he being paid his little chump change to an NBA team. So I'm with you there. It's worth taking a flyer on him, you know, especially with the mix they have on that team right now. Which is they're going for it. Griffin wants to go for it. You know, it's probably you know I'm just I, I thought he might end up going out to the Lakers or something, but. We'll see what happens, and we'll see. We'll, we'll see if he's able to reinvent himself as a role player coming off the bench. You know, uh, kind of like remember remember Bill Walton with the Celtics, for example. Yes, that's a good you know, example. He really yeah. extended his career as a role player off the bench with the Celtics after all, he had yeah. those years and years and years of foot injuries. You no, know, after he was an right. MVP with Portland. You know, yeah. if he could do, he might be able to do something like that with himself. So well, you know, yeah. the jury's still out. He's not. He's a smart player. Yeah, it's just as matter is how if if what's been drained of him physically can keep him from being effective. That the jury's still out on that. 
Yeah, and if he can, if Griffin can swallow the the pride a little bit, check the mm-hmm. eagle at the door. Not that he was, not that he was a, uh, not that he had that issue that I know. Right. Of, he, yeah, he was. He did not come off as a diva at all. If he if he could, you know, accept that role, you, I think your Walton example is is spot on. I might be a little bit. Over the top a little yeah, bit, yeah. but I, it's a good example. Yeah, it's of, similar. A guy who reinvented right. himself as a and, bench and, player. And why? Why? Because they used the Celtics used him for 12, 15 minutes a night. Yeah, they really, they really, they pick and uh, picked and choose their spots with him. Exactly. And they didn't overplay. He kept him fresh because mm-hmm. they knew they were going to go on a long playoff run, and, and they knew that they were going to need a guy like that. Uh, you know, to they were going to play into May at least. So, yeah. uh, you know, and Walton was not a. Uh, spring chicken at that point, so that's that's a really good example, and, and he really did Walton, um, and has always was been, was always very thankful to Red Arback and the Celtics for doing that for him yeah. because he was his career was was on, was hanging by a thread, yeah. and they brought him in, and they they in fact there was a story that uh, uh, when they when he took the physical uh, he was mm-hmm. in a doctor's office or something hospital or something. And the, the the doctor didn't really want to pass him. He yeah. didn't really want to pass Walton on the physical. And Red Arbeck was in the room, mm-hmm. and 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 Red said to Bill uh, Walton, "Can you play?" And Walton said, "I can play." And, the, yeah. and Red Arbeck told the doctor, "Pass him." Yeah, I've heard. He, that. I, I think they, I know the story you're talking about. Yeah, I think I've heard Walton talk about it on air. And uh, and and Walton was always uh, indebted to Arbeck for doing that. So yeah, uh, and so. We'll see. I, I, I can. I, I'm. I understand Broussard's point of view, but I can also see why the Nets would do it. And you make a good point. You know, this. You know, you, bear, you, you pick your spots of Griffin right now. Hopefully, then he's well rested and ready for the playoffs. And then you can do what you will. With, you know, you, you won't get 30 minutes a game out of him, but you might get a very, very, very effective 17, 18. And that could put that could that could put them over the top in a playoff series. So sure. we'll wait and see what happens. So. You know, you know best case guy, scenario was Bill Walton. Worst case scenario it is what it is right now. So we'll see know, what happens. He's the kind of guy, Griffin's the kind of guy that you just have a feeling mm-hmm. there's going to be a playoff game where he's going to be the guy. He's going yeah, he's going he to makes the difference. The yeah. and, and, and it may only be once yeah. in, in the whole course of the playoff run. Uh, but the, the, you just know there's a guy like that can, can there'll be a, a, a night where he yeah. just has one of those nights, and and yeah. he and, and it's going to be the Nets are going to win a game because of him. Yeah. Now, it may not be very many, mm-hmm. but um, he'll he'll win one more game in the playoffs than anybody else they would have signed midseason. Yeah, and that may be the one game they need to win a championship. Right. So yeah, I'm with you there. You know, and we'll always have that 50 point game against Philly. I oh my god, yeah. that, <laughs> I don't think that, that was just that. awesome to watch him that night. He was like that was him at, at his peak as a piston when he when he dropped 50 on on Philadelphia and to beat them. And then he made that, that layup there to the buzzer to win it? the game. What's that? that? His first game. Of, I said, wasn't that it was his early game? on? It was his first a, game as a piston. But but, was that opening night? I don't remember his opening night. It might have been first week of the season or something okay. like that. Okay. But it was early in the season. I don't know if it was yeah. opening night. And, it was early, yeah. Yeah, and he was just like, holy, oh. that, you know, this is the most talented player the Pistons had had since Grant Hill. Unfortunately, you know, he was as fragile as Grant Hill as well. So, yeah. And there's another example of a player who had to reinvent himself as a bench player or as a more of a role player after injuries. Grand Hill is another one, so oh yeah, it, it could happen for Griffin. You know, I I, I, I do kind of hope it does, just because I think, you know, who knows how his how different his career would be if that crap that hadn't gone on with the who the Clippers, where they said you'll be a Clipper for life, and then traded them six months later. You know, what a crappy way to treat somebody. So, all right, since uh, we've already I've already answered the birthday game question. Uh, oh, I forgot. We still got one more Pistons topic because Troy Weaver actually had a press conference today. Greg, what is this wizardry of 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 GMs in this town actually talking to the press? You know, uh, you know, uh, we have a bunch of GMs in town. This, you know, after three years of Bob Quinn essentially hiding for he would he would make appearances at the end of the year and he would make an appearance around draft time and that was it. Everything every, he would never ever 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 show up again. Now we got Troy Weaver, for example. You know, just you know, it's uh, coming out of the All Star break, and he had a long Zoom press conference today, and he had one quote today, to Greg, today, Greg, that I really, really dug. I mean, I thought it was great, and 
the, you know, he, they were asking, why do you use the term restore rather than rebuild? Because, you know, we're in there, we're rebuilding. And the quote was that he referred to his dad, who was, who was uh, restoring a classic Monte Carlo. And his dad said, you can only restore something that's great. The Minnesota Trumbull Wolves, they can't restore. The Atlanta Hawks can't restore. They don't have three championships. Detroit can restore. And I love that, that the flex there is like he gets the history of this franchise. I mean, this is a team for, for the most part from 1980, for about, from the, yeah, probably from the mid 80s to about 10 years ago, was, if not the, they were, they were part of the, Almost always, you know, there was a few years here and there, like the Horsehead Hit era, for example. But for the most part, they were always a competitive team and very often a playoff team. And obviously they won three championships during those years and probably should have won two more. I mean, they were, you know, they yeah. could have won five during that time frame. So I really, really like the flex there. Like, I, I'd, you know, I want, I, I like the fact that Weaver is confident in his abilities and I think he can. I think in a way he's kind of. I in, it, right now he's in "I told you so" mode because his free agent signings are working out really well. Three of his draft picks are in the freaking rotation. The other one would be if he didn't get hurt and Killian Hayes. And he said he will have an update about Hayes, Hayes' hip next week. And I, you know, as much as you, you hate to see teams tank. They're doing it in the right way in that they they aren't throwing the worst possible team out there. They are throwing a competitive team out there, and if they had had a few breaks, they would. I'm sure they would have you know maybe four or five more wins. But they, it just feels like this is they're fun. I mean, they're, they are fun to watch. This is the most fun I've had watching a Pistons team. I'd have to go back to where no to the Chauncey Billups era. That's how bad they've been for the last decade. And all of a sudden, I'm excited about a team that has the wor- second worst record in the league. But it's exciting because you can see the plan taking shape. You know, the the draft picks are playing. The Jeremy Grant, who people thought he was an overpay, is not looking like an underpay. For example, Mason Plumley, who people said, "Why in the hell would you sign him?" As two triple doubles in the past two weeks, for example, uh, you know. So if, if I'm Troy Weaver, yeah, I'm flexing a little bit because, yeah, you know, this is still early on in the rebuild, and we're probably still a few years away from could be a couple years away from maybe this team could be for the playoffs. But I, I, I'm actually excited to see where he takes this team because, so, you know, have there been a couple of mistakes. Sure, of course there has been. You're not 100 percent everything you do when it comes to building a team, but for the most part. Uh, you know, I have no compl- I have no complaints of this rebuild, how it's being handled, how it's being done, and everything. And I just have a lot of confidence in Troy Weaver right now. And that co- kind of cocky quote there, you know, calling out some other franchises, I kind of like. It's kind of got that Detroit attitude. You know, I, I can see where he's coming from, and you're coming from in that in that as regards to that kind of attitude and so forth. Yeah. Uh, I will caution, though, mm-hmm. that it's still been 17 years since the uh, going to work Pistons, and and this team has still been relatively. If you look at this, it's funny. The Pistons have a very funny history because if you look yeah. at, they've been in Detroit for about 64 years, and mm-hmm. there's only been like 15 of those years where they were relevant. Elite. The other 49, yeah. they weren't. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, and we're part of that 49 right now. But I, I'm where I do. 100% agree with you is mm-hmm. in the is is how he's been handling this this whatever you want to, he wants to call it the retool or whatever restore yeah. and because um, we were talking about the lines and you have to get lucky and so forth and, and you do have to get lucky for sure mm-hmm. but um, what's going to really kind of bear this out with Weaver is in the next two years and I know that's yeah. that's a cop because you can you can say that about any GM you can, mm-hmm. new GM is you got to look at it a couple of years but he's still you know there's I still maintain there's a lot of players out on this roster that are not going to be on the team in the next year or two uh, but there have been some surprises no question yeah. you know, Grant has is you know is having a career year 
Plumlee, who, who, like you said, was that signing was kind of maligned by the NBA mm-hmm. observers. In fact, the, the Pistons in general, as far as the NBA pundits go, yeah. did not have what they thought, what the pundits thought, right. was a very good offseason. They were kind of scratching their head. What mm-hmm. is he doing? What is Troy Weaver doing? He, he was making a, a different move every other day, it seemed like. And, and, <laughs> and it was great there because at least it was exciting. There was something different. Yeah, you weren't sure really what his, what his yeah, game was. Yeah, what, you're what's, right. his, what's his plan? What's he doing? And um, frankly, you know, and then you got to give Dwayne Casey a lot of, of credit. I know that. Yeah, in, the, in, the, in that press conference, Weaver did that today, as a matter of fact. Yeah, I mean, he can't, you know, you know, I know NBA coaches are kind of dis- dismissed almost sometimes. Mm-hmm. They're almost kind of like, it doesn't almost matter. Sometimes to some people, I don't think it matters to the they, they think it doesn't matter to mm-hmm. the coaches. And, you know, it's a player's league, no question. Uh, there's no question about that. I mean, the, the teams that have the best players win. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, that's just the way it is. But the Dwayne Casey's of the world are so important to franchises like the Pistons because they, um, without a guy like that, who's had, who's got not only the experience, but has the reputation of being a player development kind of a guy right. who loves to teach, loves, loves, loves young players. Um, you know, try this kind of a rebuild with a different coach. Yeah. Try this kind of a rebuild. Now we can we can laud Troy Weaver all we want, and and, and he should be lauded uh, because so far, you know, I, I'm I'm not displeased with anything that's really. But mm-hmm. you, you, if if there's no Dwayne Casey running the team, um, I, you know, I know the record's bad right now. It's ten and twenty six or something like that. Yeah, and it's not even so much Al that if Dwayne Casey wasn't the coach that they'd only win five games or something by now. Mm-hmm. But the, the, in general, this rebuild or retool, whatever you want to call it, if you don't have a guy like that, like Casey, who will help figure it out, who who the you know the you separate the wheat from the chaff, if you will. Right. That's the kind of guy that is invaluable. Uh, I mean, I know he's not. He's not going to get any coach of the year recognition. Nobody's nobody half the league probably doesn't even know he's still coaching in the league. But yeah. I, I do know this: that, that if you don't have a guy like that with a team that's in the state of of affairs that the Pistons are in, it it the rebuild thing half of it can go out the window because if you don't have a guy that knows how to coach these kids up mm-hmm. and he's got buy-in, he's like through almost halfway through the season now. And these these guys have buy in. I mean, they, they come out, they show up every night. Yeah. I know that they I know they're they're they don't have the talent that other teams have, and that's why the record is what it is. But you know, unlike the Red Wings, who you know, every so often you there's this effort. Yeah. There's this yeah. effort thing that goes on with them. It kind of bobs to the surface every half a dozen games or so, where they just don't right. show up. Yeah. And and with under Blashell. Mm-hmm. But with, uh, how many times can you actually look at a Dwayne Casey team? Uh, that since he's been here anyway, and say you know, boy, the Pistons just didn't show up tonight. They were just, right. I mean, they're not now. Sometimes it's in the the final score may look ugly. You know, they got beat by twenty tonight, mm-hmm. but that's not necessarily indicative of of the effort. And um, you know, the one thing they do lack, Al, obviously, I mean, beside a big time superstar, obviously, mm-hmm. is I don't really know who the leader is. You know, that's the thing when you have a young team like this, and you've got a bunch of. Pe- pieces that have some some of these guys are are you know cast off from other teams and so forth you know when you throw these lump these guys together you know i know that some of these guys are veterans and they've been around a few years but you know leaders don't emerge right away and that's part of the whole thing too is 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 they don't have there's not one guy you can look at and say that if this is his team you know this is the guy that everybody listens to and i don't know what goes on behind the scenes i don't know what goes on in the locker room but that's the one thing they don't have to me and they look on the outside looking they don't have that identified leader um you know they got rid of their veteran voices with rose and with griffin and so forth uh, so that's the one thing but that's that's part yeah. of the rebuild that that's, that's yeah. just you can't avoid that when you bring in a lot of young people and you bring in people from other teams who nobody else wanted or at least they didn't want them bad as badly as you want them you're going to have this uh, vacuum this 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 void of leadership and that's just only going to come with uh, you know the, the bad boys Pistons had Isaiah right from the get go I mean from the mm-hmm. get- time he stepped foot on the NBA court he was a leader right and the, the, the going to work Pistons were were they they, they led by mindset like, like a group mindset and Chauncey might have been the leader 
Mm. You know, you could probably say he was the leader. Right. But that was a very tough-minded, very mentally tough team, just like the right. bad boys were. And the Pistons, but they, right now they don't have that. And that's okay because they're not expected to have that right now. But but sooner or later, Al, they're going to have to – and it's all well and good. We can talk about all right. the Mason Plumleys and the Jeremy Grants and, and the Saban Lees. And all that. That's great. But sooner or later, they're going to have to find – that guy. Now we don't know who it is. I don't know that it it's could be in the coming case. draft. We don't know, but yeah, they right. do need to hit on a superstar. They do, and, and it's got and it, it it's got to be, you know, a couple of two or th- a core of players, not just yep. one guy, uh, two right. or three guys who are the glue, and yep. and those are the guys that are pistons. I mean, they are pistons mm-hmm. across the blazing on their heart. They don't have that right now. They're developing that, yep. and so that's why this process takes a little bit, but it can be accelerated. By like what you said, you hit you hit at a, a lottery pick. I still don't think even Killian Hayes was that guy. I know he's hurt, mm-hmm. but I don't I don't know if there was a buzz about Killian Hayes. There wasn't there wasn't this it, and I COVID had a lot to do with it, but I didn't see a lot of buzz by the yeah. fan base. I mean, there were some people that were excited about him and so forth, and but I, he didn't. He there's still he still doesn't have that presence. He he can definitely be one of the core guys. There's no question about it. He can definitely be yeah. one of your of the core. No question. But I don't see him yet, anyway, as being that guy who is the Pistons. So uh, we'll we'll see. Yeah, in a perfect world, you know, uh, maybe they they they're able to draft Cade Cunningham. He becomes the guy at point guard. Killian Hayes becomes a killer guy coming off the bench, and the world's all and everything's right in the world. But again, we'll have to wait and see what happens. So, yeah, I'm with you there. And for what it's worth, it looks like Great Campy's magic may be running out. They're down mm-hmm. 14 in the second half, the Cleveland State. Yeah. So, yeah. But uh, I'm rooting for you, Greg, uh, out there. Not you, Greg, that Greg. <laughs> He's on the, the one I'm on the TV over there. So. <laughs> well, my, All right, my, daughter uh, went to, my daughter's an open you, Greg. We, 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 we I'll root, root for her, too. This house. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> All right. Uh, I know we're, we're running short on time because Greg has a hard out, so we, we need to start wrapping the show up. So uh, who's your jerk of the week? You know, I, 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 I just can't believe, Al, that we've got so many of these men in their 50s and 60s who still don't know any better about how to talk to women, treat women, yeah. um, what's what's accepta- uh, acceptable and what's not acceptable. I don't mm-hmm. know where these guys have been. Obviously, we're going through the whole Andrew, Andrew Cuomo thing with, with the, these women coming out of the woodwork. And, and giving, you know, making these accusations about him. But right. in the sports sense, Les Miles. Yep. Uh, fired at Kansas because he was, uh, s- some stuff that was going on at LSU. With sexual, Which he should have been fired for and wasn't. Yeah. Um, you know, he, you know, Les, another guy in his 60s, he should know better. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the stuff that I've heard about that I've, that I've been, that's been coming out about him. And it didn't help that he went three and eighteen in two seasons at Kansas, and mm-hmm. that makes it sometimes that makes it easier too to to, yeah. to stand on your principles if you're Kansas. But uh, I, I it just see I don't know. This is the, what, when does it end? When when do these you know was, these men that are whether they're CEOs or whether they're politicians or whether they're football coaches, where do they feel like they can get off? with this kind of behavior and a not think it's ever going to be, it's ever going to come back and bite him in the ass mm-hmm. and b that, that, that it would be acceptable. I, you know, and they all, they try to, Oh, I was just kidding. And I'm, I, if I, if, if my uh, words were taken the wrong way, you know, I, you know, I, I, so, you know, Les Miles, who of course for years, Michigan fans wanted to bring in here to be the football coach. And when, when Les's stock was a lot higher than it is now, it looks like, you know, maybe it was a good thing that that never happened. Um, you mentioned that he probably should have been fired at LSU, um, but uh, you know, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't get it. I, I you know these. I don't understand this whole. You know, I'm just going to say whatever, whatever I want. I'm going to you know make these kind of remarks. I'm going to uh, touch people, touch women, and I'm going to make make. Uh, I, I, I don't. I don't get it. So yep. my trick of the week is Les Miles because he represents that whole breed of, mm-hmm. of male who just doesn't for whatever reason still doesn't get it despite their advanced years. Yeah. Uh, you know, especially with guys like uh, Cuomo, Les Miles, you know, you can name uh, uh, who, who, whatever real powerful older white guy who's gotten himself in trouble uh, due to uh, 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 to his uh, 
uh, essentially looking for sex. It's a kind of, you know, unchecked power. You know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And guys like those were were never told no. I think in anything for the most part. You know, and they they, you know, they kept pushing and pushing the envelope, and they never ever were punished ever. So, you know, it's sooner in, 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 at least in today's. You know, I know some people don't like this, but you know, if the, you know, they call it cancel culture. No, it's not cancel culture. It's being held responsible for your actions. Right. And these guys have, if if the from all accounts, what happened at LSU is true. You know, I mean, the LSU has it all has all the paperwork. Uh, you know, you, you don't have several women come. You know. One you could you know you could make the, the, you could go say oh it's he, his word versus her word, but when there's multiple women, no that's the old you know where there's smoke there's fire, and we're hearing it with right. a guy like Andrew Cuomo, we're hearing it with uh, Les Miles, and you know these guys are all finally going to have to you know deal with the consequences of their actions. In Miles' right. case, he's probably done as a big time head coach. In Cuomo's case. I wouldn't surprise me if uh, he either ends, ultimately steps down or otherwise will get voted out of office. So, yeah, I'm with Here's you there. Here's a question yeah. for you. I've yeah. got a real, real right. quick one for you. Um, yeah. I mentioned Miles' record at Kansas, 3-18. and yeah. 18. If he's 18-3, and three, does he get fired? They suspend him. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> they right. suspend him and, and, you know, and fine him or, or some such thing, you know, and then they make a donation to a – to a woman's cause or something like that. You know, we we know the drill, which is awful. You know, which yeah. is awful. But at least in this case, Kansas, you know, they might have done the right thing for the wrong reason because of his record. <laughs> right. But you know, at least there is some consequence to his actions. Right. But, you know what gets me though? What worries? What, what, he'll probably land on his feet and be, uh, you know, work for the SEC network or something. You know, when yeah. he should just go away. I mean, it, from all accounts, what he did was reprehensible. So I'm with you there. Like, they're, that's a great jerk of the week. My jerk of the week, that's kind of COVID-related. And my jerk of the week is the NBA for having the All-Star game. Oh. And it almost already blew up in their face when two players had to be uh, had to sit out due to breaching, breaching COVID protocols. Was it Joel Embiid and somebody else went to this, got, got their hair cut from a barber who ended up testing positive for COVID, so they couldn't even play in the game. You know, there was no fans in attendance. They had to shoehorn everything into essentially one evening. You know, they had uh, the three-point contest and the skills contest and the dunk contest all, you know, but right before the game. Then they had the game itself. And, well, I think they had the dunk contest at halftime. I wouldn't pay that much attention to it. But there was absolutely no reason to have an all-star game other than there was money to be made because the TV networks wanted it, the NBA wanted it. They wanted to be able to do something to make a little bit of money. And the, I think what was most galling was the they, they claimed to be doing it to raise money for the uh, historical black colleges. Yeah, you know how they, you know what they could have done? They raised to the, the make money to do the same. They could have just donated the money and not had the damn All Star Game. They're a multi billion dollar organization. Yeah. You know, so if you want to promote black historical black colleges, do it. You don't have to use it as an excuse to have an all star game. And from all accounts, most people felt the same way because it was one. I, I think I saw it today. It was the lowest rated all star game on record. I had no interest. In, I don't. I have no interest in any all star games. Period. At this point, Greg, I'd rather have the players get a few days off where they could rest yeah. and then hit the ground running for the second half of the year. And that goes for all four major sports. All-Star games serve no purpose anymore other than it gives an extra game to the TV networks. And that's it. So my jerk of the week is the NBA and the TV networks for essentially force-feeding us an All-Star game in the middle of a pandemic. And it very nearly blew up in your faces. That's, that's a great one. I didn't, th- I didn't really thought about that one, but you're right. I agree. All right. With that, why don't you get out the uh, thank yous and uh, what, social media stuff and all that fun things. Sure. Uh, once again, uh, read me every week at uh, my uh, Out of Bounds blog at uh, WordPress. Uh, last week I had a piece on, uh, oh, excuse me, Juwan Howard. And uh, check me out there. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Greg Dino. You know, follow the Knee Jerks on Twitter uh, at the Knee Jerks. And I uh, want to thank my lovely wife, Sharon, for putting up with all this nonsense every week. And thank you, Big Al, for making Tuesday night so gosh darn fun. 
Yeah, I want to give a shout out to Linda, who was uh, working her final 12 hour shift tonight after this is day six of her schedule. She's busy in the ER dealing with ungrateful patients and COVID and everything else. I don't know how she does it. So, and that goes out to all health professionals. They're all in the same boat as she is, and I don't know how they've done it for the past year. We're almost in a year, yeah. Greg. Yeah. Oh, my God. Anyway, with that, um, out of the way, get the, I want to thank you for uh, making time. I know you're busy, and you got a lot on your plate right now, so I appreciate you taking an hour out to talk some sports with me. You know, give, give my life a little meaning, Greg. <laughs> I have nothing going on right now until I go back up north. Hopefully, that'll be in a couple weeks. Anyway, uh, you want to listen to the show. Uh, spread the word, I should say, because if you're listening to this right now, you already know where to find it. But let other people know. Hit like, hit subscribe, leave a comment. Just you know, hit us up on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, spread the word that you can listen to us on Apple Podcasts. You can see us on YouTube. We're on Stitcher iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, Amazon Music, Deezer, Radio Public, the kneejerks.net, or the homepage where we'll have links and direct downloads and uh, the show notes and anything else you want to know about the show is all right there. Essentially, anywhere podcasts are found, just search the Knee Jerks and you can subscribe to our show. With that, Greg, we got to get out of here because actually we're already running late. I was given a hard out and I'm four minutes past this hard out, so... With that, we'll see you in a couple weeks. Hopefully, we'll have a little um, more. We'll actually hopefully talk about a little baseball in the next show because we'll be beginning yeah. late in the spring training at that point. So, we'll see where we're at. With that, let's get the hell out of here. So, until this time, two weeks from now, this is Al Beaton saying good evening, good luck, and aloha. Ciao, everybody. We'll see you in two weeks.